this Sunday guilty. This was a disgrace. This was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge. Donald Trump becomes the first American president convicted of a felony after a New York jury found him guilty of 34 counts of falsifying business records. I did my job. We did our job. The only voice that matters is the voice of the jury, and the jury has spoken. It's reckless. It's dangerous. It's irresponsible for anyone to say this was rigged just because they don't like the verdict. How will the historic verdict impact the 2024 race? The real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people. My guest this morning, former Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance, Republican Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, and House Democratic Leader Hakeem Jeffries. Joining me for insight and analysis are Amy Walter, Editor-in-Chief of the Cook Political Report, Leanne Caldwell of The Washington Post, former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, and Lonnie Chen, a fellow at the Hoover Institution. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Kristen Welker. Good Sunday morning, I'm Peter Alexander, in for Kristen Welker. For the first time in American history, a former president has been convicted of a crime. This past week, a Manhattan jury concluded beyond a reasonable doubt that Donald Trump falsified business records in order to influence the 2016 election, finding him guilty on all 34 counts, felony crimes. Mr. Trump, who chose not to testify, instead vented his anger outside the courtroom, claiming the trial was rigged against him and vowing to appeal. This was a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt. It's a rigged trial, a disgrace. They wouldn't give us a venue change. We were at 5% or 6% in this district, in this area. This was a rigged, disgraceful trial. But the real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people. In the days since, the former president's allies, including vice presidential hopefuls, have lined up to rail against the trial and its outcome and have attacked Democrats, claiming the fix was in from the start. What happened there was outrageous. And you're right, the American people see it. This is a, a purely political exercise, not a legal one. This is the most outrageous travesty I've ever seen. And the problem here is Democrats have crossed this line. They have crossed the line in which now the court system is a political weapon. This is the weaponization of the justice system against their political opponent. This is a justice system that hunts Republicans while protecting Democrats. This was certainly a hoax, a sham. Next up, Mr. Trump's sentencing. That's set for July 11th, just days before he's supposed to officially accept the Republican Party's nomination. With Mr. Trump's other criminal cases in Washington, Florida, and Georgia all bogged down with significant delays, the Manhattan case is likely to be the only trial Mr. Trump faces before Election Day. The question now, will the verdict impact the view of voters? Our first indication, a poll conducted in the days after the verdict, shows that a majority of voters across the political spectrum say Mr. Trump's conviction will not affect their vote. And now that Mr. Trump has been convicted, the Biden campaign is looking for ways to shake up a race that has largely remained stagnant. This morning, NBC News reports the Biden team is now accelerating its timetable to get more aggressive plans it had been holding on to for later this summer. That includes sharpening its message to argue that Mr. Trump is more focused on himself than he is on voters. President Biden, who mostly stayed away from commenting during the trial, finally weighed in. The jury heard five weeks of evidence, five weeks. And after careful deliberation, the jury reached a unanimous verdict. They found Donald Trump guilty on all 34 felony counts. Now he'll be given the opportunity, as he should, to appeal that decision, just like everyone else has that opportunity. That's how the American system of justice works. And it's reckless. It's dangerous. It's irresponsible for anyone to say this was rigged just because they don't like the verdict. And joining me now, Republican Senator from Arkansas, Tom Cotton. Senator Cotton, welcome back to Meet the Press. Good morning, Peter. Do you accept the jury's verdict that Donald Trump is guilty of these 34 felonies? 
No, Peter, I disagree with the jury's verdict here. A jury can only act within the constraints that a judge puts on it. And this case was rigged from the very beginning. You had Alvin Bragg who campaigned on getting Donald Trump. You had the judge who is a literal Biden donor. And at every turn, he ruled in favor of the prosecution. But as Donald Trump said, the real verdict is going to come on Election Day. It's going to come from the American people. And it's going to be based on things like they can't pay for their rent and put food on the table for their kids. The border is chaos. We've got war all around the world. The reason why you have this weaponization of the legal system is because Joe Biden can't defend his weak, failed record and that they, the American people see through it and they remember that Donald Trump brought peace and prosperity to this country. So let me just clarify a couple things for our audience right now. As you know well, this was a state case. Donald Trump was indicted by a grand jury in New York. He was convicted by a jury of 12 New Yorkers beyond a reasonable doubt. They didn't seek this responsibility. Joe Biden, as you know, had nothing to do with this case center. In fact, the Manhattan DA's investigation, this case began in 2018 when Joe Biden wasn't even the parties, the Democratic Party's presidential nominee. So let me ask it a different way, perhaps. Did the jury get it wrong here? Peter, I do believe the jury got it wrong. Again, the jury can only decide based on what the judge puts in front of them. Just look at what happened in this case repeatedly. Again, you had a judge who is literally a donor to Joe Biden's campaign in 2020 so he could stop Donald Trump. He should have never been presiding over this case. He introduced evidence that was highly, highly inflammatory and prejudicial. He didn't allow President Trump to uh, put on certain evidence and witnesses. He never even insisted the prosecution revealed the alleged underlying crime for which Donald Trump supposedly covered up in, in bookkeeping entries. At every turn, the, the judge put his finger on the scales, practically forcing the jury to find to reach this outcome. You're talking about the judge, Juan Marchand. He did give $20 to Democrats, gave $15 to Joe Biden in 2020. But the appeals court senator affirmed his decision to stay on the case. And as it relates to the rules, the instructions, Trump's lawyers passed on the opportunity to argue that the charges should be considered misdemeanors in the jury instructions. Republicans were attacking the judge, the jury, the legal system here, instead of letting the process play out. If Donald Trump wins on appeal, is that valid? Well, I think there's no question Donald Trump should win on appeal. So he's if he a, loses on appeal, an, would that be valid? He's an, in, he's an innocent man who did nothing wrong. This judge, again, violated New York rules by giving money to Joe Biden in 2020 specifically to stop Donald Trump. I hope that the Court of Appeals uh, in New York actually applies the law in an even-handed way as opposed to do what this judge did, what Joe Biden's Department of Justice has done, which is bending the rules at every turn solely to stop Donald Trump. The only thing Donald Trump is guilty of is being a threat to Joe Biden's reelection. And when you talk about what Joe Biden's Department of Justice has done, Joe Biden's Department of Justice is also right now prosecuting cases against Democrats. Robert Menendez, the Democrat of New Jersey, Henry Cuellar, the Democratic representative from Texas, and Hunter Biden. The case against Hunter Biden on those gun charges begins tomorrow. Let me ask you about what we've heard from former President Trump. At the first official event of this re-election campaign, Donald Trump proclaimed, I am your retribution. He talks about seeking revenge against his political enemies and says he will appoint a special prosecutor to, in his words, go after Joe Biden and his family. If it's so objectionable for the justice system to be, as you say, weaponized against Donald Trump, why is it acceptable for Donald Trump to campaign on weaponizing the DOJ against Joe Biden? Well, well first off, Peter, let me just go back to the points you made about prosecuting certain Democrats like Bob Menendez and Henry Cuellar. I I've noticed that Joe Biden's Department of Justice tends to target the Democrats that are critical of Joe Biden. Bob Menendez criticizes him for his weak Iran policy. So he's Henry recognizing Quay it against Henry people Quayar that don't like him. Henry Cuellar criticizes the president's immigration policy. They're investigating the mayor of New York because he has how criticized it, Joe sir, Biden's how about immigration his own son, policy. Hunter Biden, the case begins Hunter tomorrow. Bi Hunter Biden is guilty of so many crimes he can barely even keep track of them, unlike Donald Trump for whom they never even revealed the alleged crime that he supposedly tried to cover up. So just to be clear, though, if he was weaponizing the Justice Department, wouldn't he want to keep any case away from his own son? He was forced. His own Justice Department tried to rig a settlement. They were forced by a judge asking questions of the prosecutor and Hunter Biden's defense attorneys. But wouldn't he get rid of it completely? Why would he weaponize it against his own son and just get rid of the case altogether by your argument? 
Well, because he's going to pardon his own son after the election. And that's what, that's what you should ask Joe Biden at the White House sometime is, do you commit to not pardon Hunter Biden so let me after go back the election? To, let me go back, Senator, to my initial question, which is if it's so objectionable for the justice system, to, as you say, to be weaponized by Joe Biden against Donald Trump, why is it appropriate for Donald Trump to campaign on weaponizing it against Joe Biden? Donald Trump has said that his so-called retribution will be success. Success at the ballot well, box. He also and said an eye for an eye. So he hasn't just said success. In 2016, when so many people insisted that Hillary Clinton should face criminal charges for doing exactly what Donald Trump was wrongly accused of doing, which is mischaracterizing legal expenses as something else. Remember, she paid for the dirty R Russian dossier. They characterized it as legal expenses. She paid a fine to the FEC. Donald Trump specifically said he would not prosecute Hillary Clinton because that's not what we do in America. What the Democrats have done in New York is like something that would happen in Pakistan or Brazil. It's something that America would sanction another country for Sir, for engaging in election on interference. locking up Hillary Clinton. And he said after the election that that's not what we do in America. If New York but he was campaigned a foreign on it and then after if, said he wouldn't do it. I guess if, let's get back to the question New, about no, a Peter, Peter, if New York was a foreign country, America would sanction them for trying to target the weaponization of the legal system, their political opponents, and rigging election outcomes. Are you okay, then, with Donald Trump saying he will weaponize the DOJ against Joe Biden? He has said repeatedly that this should never happen. It shouldn't happen to him. It shouldn't happen to but Hillary Clinton. But he's campaigning on it that very basis. To. He, he, Peter, we've been down this road before. In 2016, people called for Hillary Clinton to be prosecuted. She probably deserved it. Donald Trump said that's not what we do in America to someone who loses an election like Hillary Clinton. So you disagree with Senator Marco Rubio, who says he should get even? Donald Trump has said, as recently as last month, that his retribution will be success. Success at the election and then restoring the peace and prosperity that he brought to America for four years that Joe Biden has destroyed. Since Thursday's verdict, there has been a spike in violent rhetoric online directed toward the jurors in particular, including calls to publish their addresses, physical attacks. Will you condemn those threats? Well, Peter, I don't know what obscure websites that you've gone to. Well, to no, find this these is from Truth Social. It's not an obscure website. But an he, individual says, I hope every juror is doxxed and they pay for what they have done. May God strike them dead. We will on November 5th and they will pay. You can condemn again, that threat, can't uh, you? Again, I, I will always say that violence has no place in our politics. Again, I don't know what obscure account you found on social media. Well, that it's, said it's that, on Truth Social. But I'll, it's say, on his website. But I'll, I'll say this. Where, where's the justice when you have <clears throat> Democratic street militias marching outside the homes of Supreme Court justices, carrying flex cuffs and hooligan tools so they could break into the home of justices and try to assassinate them? Exactly one person has been charged when every single person who were trying to intimidate those justices violated federal law. Why isn't the Department of Justice using the same techniques on those Democratic street militias that they're using for every grandma who wore a red MAGA hat within a country so we, mile of the Capitol? So we could agree that those that should be condemned on all sides, correct? Let me ask you about your certification of the 2020 election. You did certify the 2020 election results after Donald Trump lost. Will you commit to certifying the 2024 election results no matter who wins? Well, <clears throat> Peter, I don't think Congress has the constitutional authority to reject electors that have been certified by a state. I will accept the results of the election and certify them if it's a fair and a free election. Who now, gets to decide if it's fair? Well, ultimately, it is up to both Ultimately, it's up to the voters, but any candidate of any party has a perfect right to pursue legal remedies if they believe there's been fraud or cheating in an election, just like Al Gore did in dozens of lawsuits in 2000. That is perfectly appropriate. And then the states certify the electors. I don't think Congress has the authority to reject those electors. I also think every candidate has a right to wait until the election is conducted to ensure it's been conducted in a fair and free fashion. And, and that's different than what Donald Trump thought. Let me show some of your words from January 6th of 2021. You said, quote, it is past time for the president to accept the results of the election and quit misleading the American people. That was more than three years ago, Senator. Donald Trump still has not accepted the results. Does it still bother you that he is, to use your words, misleading Americans? No, that, that disagreement was about what could happen in Congress on that day. Once the states have certified electors, I don't think Congress has the authority to reject those electors. I wouldn't want Chuck Schumer and Kamala Harris next year to reject Donald Trump's winning electors. This is about Congress's authority. I agree with Donald Trump that there were many irregularities in the election, including Democratic cities and states changing their rules and practices in the weeks leading up to the election, or for that matter, networks like yours 
trying to suppress the Hunter Biden laptop because 51 Democratic intelligence operatives colluding with the Biden campaign put but, out sir, a letter I'm, saying that. To be clear, I'm talking about your words here, so I just want to get to the heart of it. What did you mean when you said that he was misleading Americans? Look, we had a disagreement about what could happen that day. I don't think Congress has the, elect, has the constitutional authority to reject electors, and as a practical matter, it was never going to happen. What was because he misleading Nancy the was, American people about, that, though? That any vote we took that day was going to make a difference uh, about certifying those electors. I don't think Congress has the constitutional authority. Is he still authority, misleading the American and people? And I don't think Nancy Pelosi's house was ever going to do that. Is he still misleading the American people? Look, he has said that the election had many irregularities and there was fraud and cheating in the way up to it. I so believe that question. as well. We, dis we, we had a disagreement about what could happen on that vote on that day. An that it's not going to matter next year, in my opinion, because he's going to win in such a huge landslide with more than 300 electoral votes that there won't be any dispute at all. Another place you had a disagreement on that day, January 6th, you called the people who attacked the Capitol insurrectionists and said, quote, they should face the full extent of federal law. What message is Donald Trump sending by promising to pardon these people in a second term? Well, Peter, I, I use the same term to describe the BLM riders and the Antifa riders from the previous summer. I've long said that anyone, anyone on January 6th, who attacked a law enforcement officer or damaged public property should face legal consequences. But Donald hundreds... Trump's not making that distinction, though. So should he, 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 should he pardon he those individuals as well? He absolutely has. There are no, hundreds. no, he hasn't, yes, sir. He has, he has not. There are hundreds, Peter, there are hundreds of people who were at the Capitol or even outside the Capitol that day who did not attack a law enforcement officer, who did not damage public property, who are, fa who are facing more time in jail than the Senate, than the crimes for which they are charged, many of whom are about to have their convictions erased by the Supreme Court. To be clear, though, Yet you... there's, compare, the, compare the techniques the Department of Justice used to pursue the BLM riders or these Democratic street militias outside the Supreme Court. Let me get back to the question, though. You disagree with the president on this. The president to Time magazine in the last several weeks said that he would consider pardoning all of them. You would disagree with well, that, Well, there's correct? a difference in saying he would and saying he would consider it. I think... What, Should he pardon he, all of them by your standard he, of what's appropriate? Peter, he should evaluate each case on the merits. Including which is the what, four who were convicted of seditious did, conspiracy? Which sir? is what he did in when he was present the first time. And anyone who is charged with silly misdemeanors about parading on public grounds without a permit, who did not attack a law enforcement officer, who did not p p damage public property, their pardon should be considered. In many cases, I'd say it should be granted because many of them, frankly, are about to have their convictions or their charges erased by the Supreme Court in just a few weeks. To be clear, you're making a distinction that Donald Trump has not publicly made. Let me talk about your future. You are reportedly on Donald Trump's short list of possible running mates. Would you accept if Donald Trump asked you? Well, Peter, Donald Trump is going to make this choice. I suspect only he knows who's on his short list. Has he spoken to you about this? I have not talked to the president or his campaign about his vice presidential selection or any position in his administration. Would you accept it if offered? Peter, any great patriot, if offered a chance to serve our country by the president, would have to consider it seriously. But what I'm focused on, like the president, is making sure that we win this election in November, and I want to help him govern successfully to restore the peace and prosperity that he brought to America for four years that Joe Biden has destroyed. Senator Cotton, we appreciate your time and your perspective. Thanks for joining us on Meet the Press. Thank you, Peter. And coming up right here when we come back, House Democratic Leader Hakeem Jeffries joins me next. Welcome back in Philadelphia. This past week, President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris married, made a rare joint appearance to strengthen their support among black voters and to keep former President Trump from making any further inroads with a key Democratic constituency. I'm showing you who I am, and Trump has shown you who he is. And today, Donald Trump is pandering and peddling lies and stereotypes for your vote so he can win for himself, not for you. Well, Donald Trump, I have a message for you. Not in our house and not in our watch. And joining me now is House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat from New York. Leader Jeffries, welcome back to Meet the Press. Good morning. I want to start by asking you about this historic verdict. President Biden opened his remarks on Friday saying it is irresponsible for anyone to say the verdict was rigged just because they do not like it. This crime was more than eight years old. There are questions about the validity of the legal theory, uh, untested legal theory that was used to prosecute it. Would this case have been brought against anyone other than former President Trump? Yes, of course. This 
verdict in the case of People v. Trump was a validation of the American judicial system. Donald Trump was entitled to the presumption of innocence. He received it. Donald Trump was entitled to a trial by a jury of his peers. He received it. Donald Trump was entitled to a vigorous defense. He received it. Twelve jurors, 12 American citizens, after five weeks of a trial, evaluated the facts, the evidence, and the law, and came to a unanimous decision as it relates to convicting Donald Trump on 34 felony counts. That is an affirmation of the American Co judicial system. This is America. We are not a system that is occupied by a monarch or a king or a dictator. We are a democracy, and in a democracy, no one is above the law. Congressman Jeffries, Donald Trump's attorney, as you've certainly heard, said that they will appeal the verdict. If it is overturned on appeal, will you accept that result? Yes. Simple as that. Let me ask you about Thursday's verdict then. At the time since, the Trump campaign claims that it has raised tens of millions of dollars. How concerned should Democrats be that this conviction will, tell, will help Donald Trump get reelected? Well, this election will present a clear contrast between President Biden and Democrats in the House and the Senate, uh, who will always continue to put people over politics. Extreme MAGA Republicans are going to continue to lie for Donald Trump. President Biden and Democrats are going to continue to solve problems for hardworking American taxpayers. Extreme MAGA Republicans will continue to lie for Donald Trump. Sir, those President Biden and Democrats are going to work on delivering real results, as has been the case for the last three and a half months. And we're going to see that extreme MAGA Republicans will continue to lie for Donald Trump and present no real vision for dealing with the issues of importance to the American people. That's a contrast. And I'd rather be on President Biden's side of that contrast than on the extreme MAGA Republican so side. So I want to drill down on that with you and excuse my interruption with the delay and the satellite. Those close to the Biden campaign tell me that Mr. Trump's uh, conviction is not going to be a central message of this campaign. Is that the right approach? I think the right approach is to make clear that real progress has been made on behalf of the American people because of the leadership of President Biden. We were able to rescue the economy from a once in a century pandemic. Should this be a arms, central money issue, in though? Pockets, kids back in school. I think that the issues of importance to the American people, such as the progress that has been made and the need to continue to build upon that progress and finish the job by working on continuing to build a healthy economy from the middle out and the bottom up, lowering housing costs, addressing the challenges at the border and ending price gouging will be central to the message that President Biden and House Democrats articulate moving yeah. forward. Can, can the extreme mega Republicans point to a single issue let, where they've actually made progress for the American people? A single issue? They cannot. Let me, and so as a result, what we see are conspiracy theories uh, being spewed at the direction of Donald Trump. Sir, let me ask you about another question that we'll be watching and we'll make headlines this week. Hunter Biden, the president's son, goes on trial for gun charges beginning tomorrow. President Biden said last year, quote, my son has done nothing wrong. The Wall Street Journal, as you see here, the editorial board said at the time, quote, that's a highly inappropriate message from a president. He's essentially telling prosecutors that they are wrong to bring an indictment because Hunter is innocent of any criminal behavior. Why was it appropriate for President Biden to publicly comment on his son's case? President Biden commented as a loving father, as I would hope any loving father would do. Hunter Biden, of course, is entitled, as was Donald Trump, to the presumption of innocence and to a trial by a jury of his peers. And this Justice Department is going to proceed in that fashion, present the facts and the law, and then we'll all have to wait for a determination that is made by a jury as to Hunter Biden's 
guilt or innocence. Let me ask you about what's been taking place overseas right now in news that was made just this morning. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel just accepted the invitation from you and your congressional leadership colleagues to address a joint session of Congress. We don't have a date for that yet, but the Senate's top Democrat, Chuck Schumer, recently uh, called Netanyahu, quote, a major obstacle to peace. So do you agree with Schumer's assessment that Netanyahu is a major obstacle to peace? Well, it's my hope uh, that the prime minister, upon his arrival in the United States Congress, will address the Biden peace plan that has been put forth that I think comprehensively provides a way forward to bring the hostages home, to end the conflict in Gaza, to allow for a just and lasting peace to be put into place, which is what every reasonable person Is he a major obstacle to peace, though, sir, to, to my question? It's my hope that Prime Minister Netanyahu, consistent with what has been done by the Israeli war cabinet, which is to unanimously adopt the Biden peace plan, uh, will conduct himself in a manner consistent with that Israeli war cabinet. It's on Hamas, as far as I can tell, as President Biden indicated, to accept the peace plan so we can end this conflict and move towards so just in last. So you don't have any criticism of Netanyahu's conducting of this war to this point? I think that there will be ample room to be able to assess what okay. was done right, what may have been done wrong. I certainly criticized uh, the Israeli airstrike from earlier this week. It yeah, was a tragedy. It should not have killed. happened. And we mourn for the loss of people. Uh, Leader Jeffries, I want to ask you about the president's challenges, specifically with black voters. It has been a focus of the campaign for the last several weeks. As you know well, President Biden promised legislation on police reform, on voting rights. He failed to deliver on both. Why do you think he is struggling with black voters right now, in particular black men? Well, as I indicated earlier, Peter, President Biden does have a track record of success with respect to increasing home ownership opportunities, lowering the unemployment rate within the black community to its lowest level in recorded history, record investment with respect to historically black colleges and universities, increasing entrepreneurial opportunities. But of course, there is more that needs to be done. And that will be part of the vision that is articulated for a second term, that we recognize we want to continue to promote entrepreneurship with black men and throughout America amongst people of every race. So promote home ownership and promote the creation of wealth so that everyone has a fair shot at the American dream. So you acknowledge he has some work to do with the black community. Before I let you go, I want to ask a question that I asked uh, your Republican colleagues as well, which is, will you vote to certify the results of the 2024 election no matter who wins? Certainly, that has always been uh, the case because in America, the peaceful transfer of power is sacrosanct. That's one of the reasons why many Americans, Democrats, independents, and traditional Republicans have been troubled by the election denialism or the denial that we've seen uh, coming from the other side of the aisle. I'm hopeful that this will be a campaign focused on the issues. And Democrats are going to continue to articulate our vision for solving problems for hardworking American taxpayers to create a bright future Le for everyone. Leader Hakeem Jeffries of New York. Mr. Leader, we appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. When Thank we you. come back, will the Trump conviction hold up on appeal? The former Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance joins me next. Welcome back. President Trump's weeks-long trial for falsifying business records was not his first legal battle with the Manhattan District Attorney. Our next guest spent more than two years investigating the business dealings of the Trump Organization before prosecuting the company and its chief financial officer, but not the former president. And joining me now is the former three-term Manhattan District Attorney, Cyrus Vance. Cy, welcome back to Meet the Press. Good morning, and thank you for having me back. 
Donald Trump's campaign, as you have seen, is leaning into the idea of this untested legal theory behind the case that escalated state misdemeanors into state felonies based on, among other things, a violation of federal election law. Prosecutors, this is from Ellie Honig, the former federal prosecutor. I'll put it up on the screen. He said, prosecutors got their man for now at least, but they also contorted the law in an unprecedented manner in their quest to snare their prey. You chose not to bring these charges against Donald Trump. Trump when you were DA. How much did this being an unprecedented legal novel theory weigh into your decision making? Well, we did uh, investigate uh, the former president on a range of issues. Uh, I ultimately believed that our investigation was best focused on financial crimes. Uh, first, we had a lot of time spent lost uh, during COVID where our investigations were interrupted. Uh, we had to go to the Supreme Court twice to ultimately have the highest court in the country uh, rule that the president's tax returns were, were, were not privileged and had to be turned over to investigators and that it reaffirmed the constitutional principle that even a sitting president can be investigated for crimes that occurred before he was president. Uh, so we've looked at all we looked at all the legal issues, uh, Peter. We yeah. um, spent years, and and I, I, I'm confident that we made the right choice for us at that so, time in pursuing the financial crimes investigation. As as you know, it resulted in convictions. If I can, let me ask you though, you, when you were the Manhattan DA, as you said, you charged the Trump Organization, you charged the CFO, Chief Financial Officer Alan Weisselberg, but you did not pursue charges against Donald Trump himself. How much did the fact that he was a sitting president, then former president, weigh into that decision? Well, I think, of course, it weighs into the decision uh, because uh, of the uh, significance uh, of a decision to charge a sitting president. Uh, but ultimately, we did pursue those charges that we felt were appropriate and which were backed up by the evidence and which were significant. In, in the first indictment, it was systemic tax fraud uh, and double bookkeeping in his company. Uh, and that's what we felt the, the, the charges should be. And that's where we unfortunately ran out of time. Uh, at the end of my administration, and then D.A. Bragg uh, and, took over. He redirected the efforts of the office. Yeah, and to be clear, as you have said, that there was additional evidence that D.A. Bragg was able to collect. Donald Trump's attorney says they're going to appeal this verdict. Do you think the prosecution's case will withstand an appeal? Well, certainly there will be a strong appeals, and there are going to be uh, issues that will be carefully considered by the appellate courts. What's the best grounds uh, for I an think appeal, Zai? The, the, well, I, I'm, I'm really not going to comment on something that, that uh, I, I don't think is my place to comment on. Uh, but they've identified this issue about uh, uh, charges that are not necessarily identified, a uh, choice between three charges, sort of Russian nesting doll theory. But I want to address that if I can, Peter. Uh, you know, it's not, that's not necessarily totally unusual in New York law. You commit burglary in New York, burglary of a dwelling, where you enter a person's home with intent to commit a crime therein. The jury is not required to find beyond a reasonable doubt what that crime is. Yeah. But so, so my point is that in other areas of law, this has been sustained, and I think that will be informative and perhaps decisive to the appellate courts as they look at the president's appeal. Mr. Trump's sentencing, as you know, is going to take place on July 11th next month. These are lowest, the lowest level nonviolent felonies. They are punishable by a fine, probation, or up to four years in prison. Donald Trump turned 78 this month. He's almost 80. He has no prior record. Here's what he said this morning in an interview with Fox on the topic of possible jail time. The judge could decide to say, hey, house arrest or even jail. It could. Couldn't face it could. what that could look I'm okay with it. I saw one of my lawyers the other day on television saying, oh, no, you don't want to do that to the press. I said, don't, you don't beg for anything. I don't know that the public would stand it, you know. I don't, I'm not sure the public would stand for it. If you were still DA, would you recommend jail time? Well, I'm not going to answer that question because that's really just for Mr. Bragg to decide. Uh, if you ask me, do I think the court will impose jail in this case? As I said to you, uh, I think yesterday, 
I think not, but ultimately that's Judge Bershon's decision. The president has made this a little more complicated by having been found in contempt 10 times during the court. Uh, but I think that with the proximity of the Republican convention four days after his sentencing, and then if he is the candidate for the Republican Party, the proximity of the election, I would be surprised uh, that he would be uh, sentenced to any imprisonment. What do you think going to jail would do for Donald now Trump? That, 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 said, that said, the court could adjourn sentencing until after the, the general election and let me then essentially decide then. Let me ask you about one of the key criticisms here. Mr. Trump and his allies, they keep taking aim at Judge Juan Mershon. He did give $15 to the Biden campaign in 2020, gave an additional $20 to Democratic causes then. Even if he wasn't technically required to recuse himself, should Judge Mershon have recused himself just to avoid even the appearance of a conflict? I really don't think a $20 donation and a $30 donation rise to the level of a serious appearance of a conflict. Obviously, Senator Cotton and others uh, uh, who, who are speaking for the president strongly disagree with that. Uh, I look at that both as de minimis and secondly, that it has been reviewed by the courts in New York and determined not to be a grounds for recusal. I know Judge Bershon. Uh, obviously, we were before Judge Bershon. He was our grand jury judge right. uh, when we prosecuted the Trump organization. And I think he is honest as the day is long. That he was careful. Uh, he was caring. And I think he handled a very difficult trial uh, with a neutral uh, with a neutral hand and gave the president every benefit of the doubt that he was entitled to under the law. Then quickly to conclude, Donald Trump and his allies have branded this case a witch hunt. You've heard that in particular they have been critical of D.A., Alvin Bragg, and a key member of his team who was hired directly from the Biden Justice Department. How do you respond to the criticism that this was a political prosecution. Do you remember when uh, Michael Cohen was indicted uh, by uh, U.S. Attorney Barara in 2015? Uh, the president, the incoming president, President Trump, asked Barara to stay on, and that investigation continued. So President Trump fired Barara, and he brought in a Republican U.S. Attorney, Jeff Berman, excellent man, great lawyer. Jeff Berman continued the investigation into the president, so the president fired him, too. So this has really not been just, uh, it's been, a, it's the Justice Department under uh, a Democrat and this president uh, investigated this president's conduct, and the president's response in both instances was to kill the case. Cyrus Vance, we appreciate your joining us. Thanks for coming back to Meet the Press. When we come back, why Thank drawing you. a red line in the Middle East is complicated, our Meet the Press Minute is next. Welcome back. As Israel expanded its military operation in Rafah this week, killing dozens of Palestinian civilians after an airstrike, the White House insisted Israel's actions did not cross President Biden's red line. Critics say Mr. Biden is caving on his promise of withholding certain weapons if Israel launched a major military operation there. Drawing red lines in the Middle East has been a controversial topic for decades. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pushed for his own red line in 2012 when he appeared on this program on the topic of Iran. I think a red line in this case works to reduce the chances of uh, the need for military action because once the Iranians understand that there's no, uh, there's a line that they can't cross, uh, they're not likely to cross it. You know, when President Kennedy set a red line in the Cuban Missile Crisis, he was uh, criticized, but it turned out it didn't bring war, it actually pushed war back and probably purchased decades of peace with the Soviet Union. Uh, conversely, when there was no American red line set uh, for, uh, before the Gulf War, Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait, and maybe that war could have been avoided. Very close. They're six months away from being about 90 percent of having the rich uranium for an atom bomb. I think that you have to place that red line before them now, uh, before it's, uh, it's too late. When we come back, what impact will the historic verdict have on the 2024 race? The panel is next.
Welcome back. The panel is here. Amy Walter, editor-in-chief of the Cook Political Report. Leanne Caldwell of The Washington Post. Former White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. And Lonnie Chen, a fellow at the Hoover Institution. This is a smart panel. I'm glad to be here with all of you guys today. Leanne, let me get started if we can for a second. If there's one thing that Joe Biden and Donald Trump agree on at the end of this past week, it's that this thing ultimately will be decided by the voters on November yeah. 5th. How much, though, does this verdict shake up this race? Well, there's some things we know, and there's a lot we don't know. <laughs> what we know is that this will absolutely motivate the Trump base. What the Biden campaign hopes is that this shores up the Biden base, which has been drawn away from him recently. What we're also looking for is where those independent voters, especially those voters who haven't been paying attention miraculously yet to anything, where they go. Do they think that this is going to push them toward Trump because he is a victim or is this going to push them before toward Biden? because they don't want to vote for a felon. And so that's what we don't know. But what the Biden campaign is saying, though, is that what they think is that this will absolutely not grow Trump's base. This does not bring in tr new Trump voters. And we'll have to see if that is actually what happens. Amy, though. there's only limited polling so far. This right. was a hypothetical. Now it's a reality. We right. really have to wait. Anyone who tells you they know is lying to you right now. But is there any evidence that this would backfire, that this would hurt Donald Trump? Well, I think this race ultimately is going to come down to the 28 percent or so of Americans who say they dislike both candidates and they are not interested in either one of these candidates. They see liabilities in both. And so ultimately, this race is about where does that spotlight go in October? Today, at this moment, it is on Donald Trump and his liabilities, which I think hurts him. It has, for most of this campaign, been focused on the president yeah. himself, Joe Biden and his liabilities, which we've seen in the polling is not helping him. So where is that spotlight? Once we get closer to the election, that's where those 20 percent or so will decide. That's why there's a fear about RFK, about Kennedy, yeah. also a fear about erosion. People just decide right. to sit this one all right. out together and who that impacts. Gen President Biden blasted Mr. Trump for calling the justice system rigged and the Biden campaign mm -hmm. started to lean into this strategy of mm -hmm. calling him a convicted felon. I've been speaking to Biden allies. They say this is not going to be a central mm -hmm. message going forward. What is the sharp strategy here. Should this be a key message going forward? Well, I, first, I think it's important to say it's better not to run as the convicted felon, and Trump doesn't have that choice. And so for the Biden team, their challenge is how do you appeal to the people Amy referenced, right? The double haters, you can call them anything you want, the people who are not excited about either choice, while also shoring up the base of your party. And for President Biden, a lot of people in the base of the party would love to have him wearing a T-shirt with Donald Trump behind bars. Mm -hmm. But that night may not be appealing to that group of people who right he needs to pull to his side. So the biggest moment that I'm watching is the debate, which is 25 days away, Lonnie mm -hmm. just reminded us of, and how President Biden does, how he handles this in that debate. Is he going to scream convicted felon at Donald Trump? Maybe we're in unprecedented times. That doesn't sound like his style to me. But he's going to have to draw the contrast on this while also reminding people that he is the one who's going to defend abortion rights and all of the other issues that people really care about. That's tricky. And the debate is largely performative in a lot of ways, too, right? How do these two men, 178, 178 this month and 181 perform for this debate event? Lonnie, Mr. Trump is casting himself. You've seen the, the campaign effort so far as a political prisoner. Obviously, that's not the case. He has legal representation. He has has the right to an appeal. He's not been detained, hasn't been imprisoned, but his supporters are now attacking the judge, the jury, the entire legal system. Is there a risk that this backfires on Donald Trump? Yeah, I'm really not sure that any of this aftermath that we're looking at matters. Let us return to the fundamentals of this race, okay? You have a president with a historically low approval rating, 39% for comparison. Barack Obama at this stage of his presidency was at 48, George H.W. Bush at 40, Donald Trump at 42. So historically low uh, approval ratings. You have an economy. We had inflation numbers on Friday that show us inflation's basically sideways. What does that mean? People are still struggling with the cost of living. The economy remains the top issue for this election. Yeah. And then the final thing is, what are the voters? Who are the voters that we really care about when it comes to deciding this election? You know, there's 99 percent awareness of this of this verdict against Donald Trump. You mentioned about a quarter, about 25 percent of voters are the double haters. I'd say who we really care about from the perspective of the election are about six one hundredths of one percent of voters. <laughs> all right. And that's people in the six swing states. 
And will it really matter to them? I'm not sure that it will, because fundamentally, the issues they care about, the economy, immigration, those are the ones I believe this election hinges Jen, on. Jen, you're trying to get in. I, I was just going to say, I, I do think when you talk to candidates, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, we, nobody knows what the impact of this will be. And some of it may be hard to measure, because there are things like character, baggage, that's hard for people to measure in polls. But I do think issues like abortion rights, any candidate you talk to, that's what they want to be talking about in this election. Ones who are up for vulnerable re-elections or who are candidates challenging Republicans. So it's, it's not that they don't want to talk about Trump as a convict, but they want to talk about other issues that they feel there's a bigger contrast. Amy, let me add. Oh, Leanne, please. Better, well, I, was, I was just going to add to that. And you can see the difference in the parties. If you look on what's going to happen on Capitol Hill this week, you have Republicans who are going to lean into this verdict to defend Donald Trump, trying to slow down everything that's happening in the Senate, while also trying to bring in Alvin Bragg before a, a committee. Meanwhile, you have Democrats in the Senate who are focusing on IVF, abortion, contraception, because they think that those are going to be the winning issues. So you have this split screen happening on what this campaign should look like. Amy, he, President Biden, according to the Cook Political Report's own polling right now, is trailing down ballot right. Democrats in a ton of these key races right now. Why is he struggling so much with Democrats? Well, it goes all right to what Lonnie's saying about the economy. People are looking at this election through that lens. They're not looking at it as much through the lens of abortion rights or IVF or the issues that are beneficial to Democrats. When it is about, you know, these last few years, Donald Trump has been the center of everything. Yeah. This is the first time where he's not. Now, at this moment, he is because we're talking about this historic trial. But in a few days from now, we're going to be talking about the things that we've been talking about for the last few years, which is what is happening on the economy, what's happening overseas, how are voters reacting to that day to day. But the fact that this race is as close it is, as it is, given, as Lonnie pointed out, how uh, low his job approval ratings are, tells you that what's baked in is assumptions about both of these. Lonnie, how do, we mark, how do we mark this moment in history? This was, <laughs> this was a huge week in American history, regardless of your opinion of the verdict. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting time in American politics because you have the degradation of institutions, right? And this is something that both people on the left and the right, for their own reasons, believe, for example, the judicial system has been either validated or corrupted. You have people who believe uh, that going forward, you know, all of these institutions that we used to hold in such regard uh, are, are no longer ones that we hold in high regard. But going forward, I do think this is a much more difficult pirouette for Biden and the Biden team in terms of thinking about how do you take this bundle of issues and how do you refocus voters on the things that they might actually care about going into November. Uh, and, and I think for Trump, it's always been about making lemonade out of lemons. And I think that's something that Trump and the Trump team are pretty good at. I, I, I should say, thought, I mean, please. their opponent is a convicted felon. I don't know that it's harder for them. They have to just make that mean something to the public, not just about his moral failures, but how him being in the White House would impact them. That's the, that's the pivot. I was just going to say on the degradation of institutions, you've seen this over and over again through the Trump White House with the judicial system, the electoral system, the federal bureaucracy, and it's going to further continue. All right, guys, this is a great panel, but I do have some more important news than any of you. I apologize. Before <laughs> we go, we are thrilled to share some very happy news with you. The Meet the Press family officially has a new member. Kristen Welker and her husband, John, have just welcomed John Zachary Welker Hughes to the world. Look at the nugget. This little guy was born on Thursday, May 30th, weighed in at a cool seven pounds, even measured almost 20 inches long. John Zachary's big sister, Margot. As you can imagine, she is extremely proud welcoming home her baby brother yesterday. Kristen shares that their surrogate, who she calls her angel on earth, is doing great. From all of us here at Meet the Press, a huge congratulations to Kristen and John and Margo and all the grandparents. And to John Zachary, we know you're watching. We can't <laughs> wait to meet you. We thank you for watching. And remember, if it is Sunday, it is Meet the Press. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.